from the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's Just the Tip Sirs with Melissa Morgan. Welcome. Once again exercising her hostess duties flawlessly by serving up a hot, fresh murder-tizer, an appetizer of murder. Today was something magically delicious or something. Remember, if you've got a tip for Melissa, call the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. Or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. You just might hear your tip on the podcast. And now here's your host, plucking the weird out of the weeds and the weeds off of shallow graves everywhere, Melissa Morgan. More cowbell. While I would love to pick the weeds off of shallow graves and find things that other people have hidden, you know I don't like the out of doors, producer Mark. Well, that's true. Uh, maybe you maybe you do it like. Uh, I would do it from behind a car, inside with the windows oh, rolled right. up and the air on and pointing. You yes, point, yes. Pointed people that do it for you. C- yes, that that I would. Li- and I'm not. I don't consider myself, you know, supervisor. But well, I don't like the out of doors. You'd be the brains behind the operation. I would like to sure. think. I would like to think that. I think yeah. that. That means a lot. I appreciate you thinking that I have. You know, Michelangelo, he didn't really paint all that stuff on the Sistine Chapel. He had what? lots of other people helping him. What? He was, didn't you know that? No. So, yeah. It, it, those, all, those famous, all those famous artists, you know, they had assistants helping them pay, paint. What? Yeah. So you would, Why? You would be, it would still be your masterpiece, darling. Is my, is my whole life a lie now? <laughs> no. Why, what is happening? Nothing. It's all right. It's he, perfectly fine. He didn't. He did. Yes, he did. And so did the people helping him. Oh, he had, no. He had assistants. Oh. oh all no. following his lead. Wow. His painting. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm heartbroken br- right now. My whole life is a lie. You've. No. No, it's okay. It's all right. Maybe we should readjust and move forward. We got. With the with the podcast. Well, it it explains why the statue of David has giant hands and a tiny cock, because <laughs> he's not good at telling <laughs> proportionality. Yeah, like you know, some maybe one of the guys he got to help him is like myopic uh, or it's like maybe Ernie David's penis was much bigger. I don't know if Michelangelo. You get back there and you oh shit you can't add lime. You just chip away, <laughs> and you chip too much away. God damn it. That's now David's call. just known as Teeny. <laughs> Little Davy. What you call marble uh, circumcision. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I'm, but I am a little bit crushed, but I guess I'll, I'll move forward. So uh, before I forget, as I do pretty much every episode, if you would love to go onto iTunes and give us a five-star uh, review rating, we would be deliriously happy. If you would take some time out of your day and review the podcast, that would be great. Um, if you want to rate us uh, a five-star, remember the name of the podcast is Just the Tipsters. And if you don't don't like the podcast, remember it's uh, Death Be Not Proud. Right. I don't even know. I'm I'm running out of dead words. Um, but we would really appreciate that. It helps people find us when you review us on on iTunes. And if you have a story idea you want to send to us, please feel free to email us at jttipsters at gmail.com. You can call us at our tipster hotline, 832-TIPSTER, 832-847-7837. And while I'm um, going through the checklist of the housekeeping... I feel like it's very important that I uh, mention our new sponsor. Hello, shit. If you're looking for a way to bring more healthy food choices into your life, don't look here. We like junk food. And I often say that I eat like shit. So imagine my joy when a company like... (laughs) Can't get through it, can you? (laughs) Like, hello, shit, decided to sponsor our program. They offer such varied choices as Flaming Cheetos and Mountain Dew Party Pack. And they have pork rinds for those on a high-protein eating plan. 
and they have nothing at all for those who are interested in gluten-free, wheat-free, or joy-free eating. They only offer high calories and low nutrition in their meal kits. So if you're looking to add more bad choices into your life, go to helloshit.com.cheeto.sugarhigh.gov.edu.no and enter tipster love for 11% off of your first subscription box. And remember, it's hello shit and welcome stretchy pants. Right. I Again, I just didn't know we had these new sponsors. It's Well, it's, I live to serve you. Okay. That's why I'm here. <laughs> when you said, when you all of a sudden just went, hello shit, I just, <laughs> I about lost it. Thank well, you. I don't know why you're. Why uh, you're so a, unprofessional? Listen, I'm sure they're a proud spot. We're a, they're a proud sponsor. They're a proud sponsor yes. of us. They're right. A, we're very blessed to have the sponsorship of mm. Hello Shit mm. Meal Delivery Kit. Right. It, it rhymes too, so that's good. Wow. So this episode is going to be uh, shortened, but it's it's um, a murder tizer, but it's a fascinating story and it's funny, and it. It lends itself to what I'm going to say because I can't imagine anyone who would love this story any more than Gary Humphreys. So we have lost a member of the tipster family. Uh, Mark's father, Gary Humphreys, passed away a few weeks ago. And we are going to be uh, traveling uh, north for his um memorial uh, mass and his celebration of life. It's over a couple of days, so... That is why we are doing this murder tizer in his, in his honor. Because honestly, I don't, I don't know anyone who would enjoy this uh, more than he Gary. Would, I think he would love this. Story. I, I think he, I, I, I don't think I know. So he would absolutely. So, I know Mark can fill in um, some blanks here, and I just wanted to say that as someone whose you know parents were divorced when I was um, still an infant. I had a great grandfather who was my mom's a dad, who was a grandfather and a dad. And he never tried to overstep his bounds as a father, but he was definitely a male presence in my life that probably enabled me to um, move forward and not, you know, be as more damaged than I am. And Gary Humphreys was an amazing father-in-law. And I'll let Mark speak to what sort of a father he is, but, um, and grandfather, you know, seven kids, Mark's the oldest of, of Gary's seven kids. And I know Gary and his mom, Rita are very proud of Mark and, and all of their kids. They have, I think 15 grandkids now. Got a couple of great grandkids, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. Ben has a couple of kids. Oh, I forgot. Yes, yeah. they do. They have great grandkids. You're right. I thought, yeah. oh, now you're making them older than they, they married quite young. I forgot they do have great grandkids. They do. Um, so Gary was apparently before I met him, a royal prankster and, um, he still had, uh, quite a twinkle in his eye, uh, like a leprechaun, a little leprechaun who had a twinkle in his eye. He would tell the absolute worst, uh, literal dad jokes. They're just literal dad jokes and they were terrible. And half the time he would mess up the punchline, but he had such a charismatic way of, of rolling them out. You would, li- you would just sit and listen no matter what. And some of them were elongated and you were like, could this please just not go on forever? But you couldn't help but enjoy it because he enjoyed it. And it didn't matter if he'd told you seven times, it was still fresh and new. Um, every time he told it, yeah. so when when he and if he got it wrong, you know, and you're like, <laughs> or if you're saying, is that the whole thing? He'd still giggle. He'd still. Oh just, yeah, he loved just, telling oh, them. My God, even he, if they were <laughs> nonsensical. If it at annoyed best. you, if it annoyed you, it made him <laughs> even happier. So I um, came along after this, but uh, one of Mark's brothers, uh, Phil, his wife Jana, mentions, I guess, the uh, infamous yard fertilizing incident oh yeah so i'll let you explain that well that's you know, i was not there see this is the thing i'm the <laughs> oldest of so i'm the responsible one so <laughs> i didn't really get in on any of this kind of stuff when they did it but apparently right after my brother met my my, my the second youngest the second oldest phil after he met the woman who he would eventually married uh he introduced <laughs> he introduced Jana to the family by uh, going out to dinner with my dad 
and uh, another one of my brothers, Tom, I think it was. And they uh, they went out to dinner, and um, this was in where we used to live. It was uh, my dad at the time lived in Denver, and he was visiting. Um, the San Jose area where Phil and Tom still lived, and they started talking about an ex-neighbor that we had in the San Jose area when we were a family living there, and they were terrible busybodies, awful, awful busybodies, and uh, just harassed everybody in the neighborhood, and um, they started talking about him, and one little drink led to another little drink, and then they all drove over. And this is this this is my sister-in-law who's meeting these guys for the first time my brother and tom and my dad for the first time watching them get a little loaded and they they drove over to these people's house in like midnight and there was some relief that happened on their lawn um liquid relief from my dad and my brother tom my brother phil on the other hand decided to outdo them and let's just say there's a particular part of the lawn that was probably a lot greener the next day. So he dropped the deuce in your busybody neighbor's yard. Yes, and they laughed and laughed and laughed. And, and my future sister-in-law kind of said, okay, better readjust my thinking about this family because I'm going to marry this guy. And <laughs> now I've got to get used to it. That's the kind of stuff they used to do. The, well, yeah, Gary was um, always up for for a practical joke and uh this this story is is right up gary's alley uh no no pun intended in a, a butt or a urethra way <laughs> but i i i could actually picture gary doing this apparently um he and his longtime friend frank were both i think in the military and they both went to high school together? Well, they went to high school together, okay. yeah. And they apparently pulled a lot of uh, fun, fun pranks together. So these these two boys, um, spoiler alert, don't make it out alive, but kind of, it it's, it's not real sad. Um, these two boys could, I think, have been Gary and Frank, except they wouldn't have done uh, something as dangerous, but they would do something just as goofy. So this young man, David Cotton, is um, a student in, uh, I guess it would be like the north uh, western part of Tennessee, Gallatin, Tennessee. So David Cotton and his friend Jonathan Skinner, and they don't really know where they became acquainted because Jonathan Skinner was a, a student at uh, Western Kentucky University. So it's about 80 miles um uh, west of Nashville. And it's, you know, a, a well-respected college. Western um, Kentucky University in Bowling Green was always well thought of, a, a very um, esteemed, old, venerable uh, learning institution. And Jonathan Skinner was majoring in meteorology, which I thought was really interesting because I'm not sure what you do unless you become a meteorologist or maybe you just sit around at the weather channel and press buttons and and you know talk. or you become the weather guy the, you know that's li- what i mean live, yeah. at f- live at five well exactly and... that's what i'm saying that's it's pretty weird so they don't really know how jonathan skinner got involved in this but apparently david cotton felt maybe that he needed help so on march 17th of 2010 David Cotton walks into a bank. He walks first into a fifth third bank, which I know Mark has. Can I, can I say <laughs> more about that? I'm sorry, I can't help myself. There's a, there's a, it's a bank. It's a big bank. It's mostly in the Midwest. It's called Fifth Third. Uh, fifth Third. That's one and two thirds. <laughs> Why don't they just call it one and two thirds bank? They're bankers. Right. How, how could you trust your bank? If it's got a name, if it's called Fifth Third. Right. I'm sorry. I just had to. I'm sorry. No, you, sir, uh, I grew up in the Cincinnati area, Northern Kentucky area. Fifth Third was the shit. It was the bank. And it's one of those things where you hear it and you don't, you know, you use it on a daily basis, but you don't know, know why. And it's just because that's what you've heard your whole life. But I do remember getting a little older and I was never really good at math, but thinking, 
what the fuck is a fifth third? And why, why would you name a bank like a weird fraction? And do I, do you have to know like algebra to have an account there? Yeah. It's, it's fucked up. The first time I saw it, I, I was, when I was on tour, I, I, what, the first time I went on tour in that part of the country, I, you know, I, I saw it the first time and I didn't, it didn't register. And then it kind of, <laughs> the second time I saw it, I drove by it and I thought, and I was just, it kind of, it was a delayed reaction. And I thought, right. That's called that. Uh, then I see them every, it's a huge bank. Yeah, it is. A, I, it's so weird. I thought, uh, growing up that it was a local, a local thing. I did not think of it as being like a national, not even national, but anything more than like on the, on the corner of main street in florence or something i never thought that fifth third was a big ass deal and then when i you know got old enough to understand you know state lines and spent more time in ohio going across the river to cincinnati to go shopping it was in ohio and i was like oh it's in ohio too and then now hearing that you know it it still th- it was still thriving as of 2010 in in a really nice part of Tennessee. Oh, it's still around today. They, I'm they, stunned. They advertise. I mean, I think they, I, you know, I listen to a lot of ball Fifth games. Fifth Third, the only bank you'll yeah. ever need. Yeah, they, and then they just talk about it, you know. Uh, you yeah. Know, the Fifth Innings brought to you by your friends at Fifth Third Bank. Well, why? What the fuck? Why don't you say something about that? Right. Why don't you? For, it, it, I think when you get to understand what it looks like, you think to yourself, I wonder if their sign's busted. Like if maybe somebody, <laughs> like somebody put the sign up wrong or half the lights are out or it's only really like five and fifth thirds or one third and five or 5.3 or something. Anyway, so Sharon Ryman, who's the manager of the Fifth Third Bank in Gallatin, Tennessee, notices that a, a man comes in wearing a, and, and there are p- many pictures online. It was covered, apparently became a national news story, which I did not remember hearing it on the West Coast, but you know, maybe. So it was covered in, I mean, I found newspaper articles like all the way up to Pennsylvania. And I mean, it's pretty fascinating. So uh, he goes in, it's March 17th. um, David Cotton goes into the Fifth Third Bank and he's wearing a giant green top hat with a shamrock on it, a metallic shamrock, a vest and shorts, a fake brown beard and a wig, and he would kind of stood around that bank and then changed his mind. And and Sharon, it looks formidable. So maybe he just was like, I don't know if I can take this one down. And he goes next door to the first state bank and wearing the same leprechaun costume or or as um, Anna Gasteyer says on Saturday Night Live, Leprechaun. Wearing a Leprechaun costume, he goes into the First State Bank and he's got a large caliber gun. And there is a still image from the video where um, a manager, which I have to say that I'm wondering if he went to the First State Bank because Fifth Third looked too high tech because the First State Bank is like, quite frankly, a woman that looks like Aunt B handing, leaning dangerously over her desk to hand a leprechaun a bag of money, a big blue bag, a big blue bank bag of money. And I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a counter. It's not a bank counter. It's not a a regular bank counter behind bullet, bulletproof glass. It's like a woman at a desk in a lobby with her phone and her computer, it's not any. It doesn't look like a bank. It might be. It might be a business bank because that they, they, or, they, or a savings and loan or something. Yeah, or or uh, high, you know, high net worth uh, oh. depositors. Okay. Well, whatever it was that attracted uh, David Cotton as a leper leprechaun to the First State Bank, that's where he went, and he got he got the bag and ran out, and Jonathan Skinner was waiting for him as the driver. So what transpires is, is not the funny part because, um, but, but a fascinating guy, (laughs) this 20 year old kid, I just, he, uh, shoots out the passenger side of, uh, the getaway car and shoots the police officers that are trailing them, uh, 
no, no one else got hurt, by the way, shot at the front of the car and disabled the car, disabled the police car. So you got the scene One shot. of a guy dressed yep. as a leprechaun. He's a marksman of some sort. Apparently. And he's dressed as a leprechaun. He's, he's shooting out the passenger side window. He's leaning out dressed as a leprechaun, shooting at the police and shot right in the front of the car and I guess hit the engine and disabled it. So they had to pull over. Uh, they said glass and metal went flying everywhere. I don't know what kind of shot he did, but... Whatever. I wonder what he was firing. If I, a very was... large caliber gun is what they said. Yeah. They said he walked into the first aid bank with a large caliber gun. So those police officers have to pull over. Not a, no one was injured. The car did not make it, but they did. And other police uh, shoot around them to chase them. Now, a shootout is, is happening. They got a little bit ahead. And uh, during the shootout apparently Mr. Skinner was hit. So they pull over and get out and run into a field. And uh, David Cotton killed himself before the police got to him and Jonathan Skinner succumbed to his injury uh, from the police. So they both died. I know that's not funny. It, Although it the, is, uh, a leprechaun shooting himself. Yeah, yeah because... I was going to say to myself, I wonder how you feel. It's like, well... Well, you know, I did my best. I gave it a good shot, but I got to go now. And I hope I, wherever I'm going, I'm there. It's it's okay if I'm dressed like a leprechaun and choose himself. So they, because of the odd circumstance, they go back and look at other cases. And I'll be darned if Mr. Cotton hadn't robbed a SunTrust bank on December 22nd in Gallatin, Tennessee, dressed as Santa. So he had a thing. He had a thing going on. He had a, he and Mrs. Jones had a thing going on and I, I, he got away with it and ironically looked further back. And in 2007, he had broken into a school, stolen a bunch of electronics and did a lot of damage and, but he was underage. So he was given probation. So he, he was on a not good path. Um, but he was funny. He, uh, you know, like on, on social media described himself as always looking for an adventure. Yeah. That's pretty much you, David. Uh, Cotton. Well, he found one. Yeah. He found a, a several, I'm guessing. Um, he had a video on YouTube that supposedly showed him uh, operating a device that he had invented called the bad vibes device and he would aim it at people and it would be like you know good vibes good vibes and he would point it at himself and it would say bad vibes every time so he's got a sense of humor and he's you know creative and you know maybe he just should have decided to make like gags and jokes as opposed to yeah you know, you know when, when you think of it there there but for the grace of god go a lot of comics uh, <laughs> right it, it you're you're uh you're bad vibe machine stops working and you, you're like, well, I can't get any gigs. I need to rob a bank dressed as a leprechaun. So I kept thinking to myself, what, like, had David Cotton gotten away with the St. Patrick's Day robbery? Like, would he have, like, expanded his, you know, repertoire? Like, you know, May Day, he goes into a bank dressed as a pole, um, not like, not like a Polish person, but like an actual pole, <laughs> like a May pole. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. With like strings of flowers on him and like, you know, Valentine's day. It's like, Oh, Cupid's got an assault rifle. <laughs> Guy wearing a diaper. Yeah. And a little... Yeah. He's given up the bow and arrow. Cupid's got an assault rifle. Yeah. Like our Ar Arbor day, like the bank employees are coming into work and they're like, wow, they've really updated the landscaping. Oh my God. That ficus Benjamina has a gun. Maybe, could and of be. Of course, all the all the patriotic holidays would have been fun too. Well, you know? I was thinking like Thanksgiving. He's dressed as a Native American elder. It's like hand over the money, Bish. <laughs> the great horned owl god said, "Give it to me." <laughs> yeah, and he probably would just stay home like Martin Luther King Day. Probably just stay home. Oh, they're closed. Banks are right, closed. Right, so, they're yeah, closed, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. So he's probably just not going to do that, but. I was just thinking, I wonder if he would have, you know, branched out and been more creative than we, I mean, maybe he would have 
maybe he would have become like this um, legendary bank robber who always dressed as a specific holiday. This is true. And you know what? If he had if he had pulled off another couple, he would have become a legend and people would have loved him. You know what? That's that's probably true. That's probably true and sad. Well, that's that's very American too. We're, we're, <laughs> that's sorry. Are you saying he's an entrepreneur? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the thing I think that's so fascinating is that they don't really know how Jonathan Skinner met David Cotton. You know, like they, he wasn't going to Western Kentucky University. Um, Jonathan Skinner lived not far from David Cotton. Like, I wonder if they met on like online on a meteorology website, like, hey, um, I want to rob a bank dressed as a leprechaun and I can't see past my beard. Can you drive a car? That, that your guess is as good as any. <laughs> Maybe Jonathan Skinner would have grown up to be Ryan Gosling in, what was it called, Drive? Ooh. Uh, no. That? No? Okay. Yeah, he looked like a sweet kid, but I mean, I just, I feel, I feel bad for all of them. And, and of course, um, Mr. Cotton's family, his parents were, you know, were crushed and they, they left a, a message on their outgoing answering machine that said, we loved our son the way, you know, all parents love their children. And we are so sorry for Mr. Skinner's family and grateful that there were not more bystander, bystanders injured. I mean, I can't imagine having to, you know, you've, you're being called by so many, you know, media outlets or, you know, the police and you have to leave an out. I mean, like, how long do you leave that on, you know, your answering machine? Like, you know, please, please give us our privacy our son dressed as a leprechaun. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is so terrible to laugh I know. at it, but you know. I can't help it. I, I know, I have the feeling Gary Humphreys is up there like, okay, that's funny. Yeah, I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're having a beer or something. Oh, or you, something. Think, you think Mr. Cotton went there? Um, yeah, he didn't, he didn't kill anybody. He killed himself. He killed himself. He got his friend killed or his well, driver. I guess that's true. Yeah, I do. You know, it's they always say like that bank robbery is a victimless crime because the FDIC covers everything. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I really I mean, you can think of it as as a I mean, he, he showed up with a large caliber weapon and he was in a shootout with the police and he was really lucky he did not kill any officers. That's, that's true. That's he killed true. a police car. But, you know, David Cotton, he, you know, had a. Um, you know, he was probably an adrenaline junkie. And if he says on all of his social media, always looking for an adventure, I think he just decided to make his own adventures. And it, it seemed to me like, not that he was cavalier, but, you know, I don't know that he brought a gun to the first, um, bank robbery. I doubt he brought a gun when he broke into the school and stole the electronics, but something upped the ante between December of 09 and March of 2010 that he was like, I guess I'm, I'm going pro now. I need a driver and a large caliber weapon. And he used both to a really bad end. And I feel, I feel sorry for Mr. Skinner's family and for his family. But I know Gary Humphreys is like, that guy was pretty badass and more cowbell. Remember, if you've got a tip, give us a call at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837 or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. <laughs>